Our sermon text for today, which also uses the imagery of fruit, here speaking of the fruit that come in the lives or that are found in the lives of those who are controlled, those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians and to all of the world and says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the Word of God. As I was thinking about the sermon for today, working with the text and so on, of course I noted that this was Memorial Day weekend. And my thoughts turn to the holiday of Memorial Day weekend. Some of the memories I have, again, of walking in parades in the little town of Orinoco, Minnesota, and going, you know, the little town of about 300 and marching up the main street and then up the hill to the cemetery with the VFW guys in their regalia and then placing memorials on tombs and so on, of going out to the cemeteries and going out there and placing flowers and remembrance on loved ones and relatives and going there to the cemeteries and seeing all the standards with the stars, with the American flags on them, indicating that this person who had passed away had served in the military. And then, of course, probably the main reason or the narrow reason for the day, celebration of Memorial Day, is specifically to remember, to give thanks to God for, to honor the memory and to show respect to the families of those who died in the wars, the battles, and in service to our nation in the military. Men and women who, as it is often referred to, paid the, or gave or paid the ultimate sacrifice for their nation. Memorial Day is a good day. It's a good thing to remember and to pause and to contemplate and for parents to speak to their children about and to, to talk about that people considered what we have in this nation to be so precious. The freedoms that we have here, the liberties that we have here, the blessings that we have here in the nation, that it's so precious that people not only were willing to serve, but they were willing to give their life to defend it, to protect it, and even attempt to share it with others who do not live in this nation. And again, the blessings are obvious. Again, you look at the blessings we have, the blessings that we're exercising this morning, that we have the freedom to gather without having to get special permission from the government. And that's been brought to mind, in my mind, how precious that is as I deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries around the world where they're prevented from gathering together because they don't have a government license yet. And therefore, if they gather together, they're subject 
to persecution just simply because they don't have the official permission. We don't need that. I think of my brothers and sisters in Christ elsewhere in the world who have to be very careful and very clever, but they do it as they witness the gospel in nations where they live, where it's against the law to proselytize, to try to reach out to somebody and convert them. Where the law only gives you a freedom to acknowledge what you believe. And to be honest with you, I've been very impressed with how people living there have become masters at starting conversations where somehow it's worked out that the person they're talking to is moved to ask, and what do you believe? Thus opening the door to share the gospel. But I didn't come here to turn this into a mission sermon. I'm here to talk about Memorial Day. And I think about the people, as I said before, who are willing to live their lives in service to the nation. And even if the situation was worked out, that they were even willing to give their life to defend what we have. Again, you can go through history. I think of the War of 1812 after the United States is established and they're just, the country is just enjoying these freedoms of liberty where you don't have a king or queen mandating that you go to this church or that you, if you pay taxes, it's because the people you elected as your representatives gave permission and you have the ability next time around to either keep them in that job or take that job away. And when that freedom was attacked again, people stood up and defended the nation and gave their lives. And you could go through all of history of the United States. You could go against the battle to divide the Union. You could go and then move on to the war to end all wars. You could go on to the defense of freedoms and persecution against fascism. You could then go on to the defense of freedoms and liberty against communism. And to this very day, the people that are willing to give their lives in defense of and against terrorism. People who are willing to give their lives and even pay the ultimate sacrifice, those who have done so in defense of these freedoms that, to be honest with you, we often take for granted, they deserve our respect and our honor. And probably one of the greatest ways that we as citizens of this nation are called upon to honor the people who paid that ultimate sacrifice is to not to give in to trends, not to give in to ideas, not to give in to the very attitudes which they gave their lives to prevent. I mean, what a disgrace and dishonor for every veteran, every person who died in the battlefields of World War II. What a great sadness it would be that if in some way or shape or form, the freedoms that they died for would be negated because we willingly agreed to create some type of fascist government like the Nazis here in the United States. How horrible it would be if for all the people who died defending their, our nation against communism, where people were told, you may not believe in God. In fact, the official state stance, and if you want to be part of the party, party, part of the party you could be part of the party too, but anyway, part of the party was you must deny that God exists and you must be an atheist. What a disgrace to the memory of those who gave their lives fighting against that if we willingly gave up that freedom of religion. And what a disgrace to the memories of all those who in recent times gave up their lives against terrorism, fighting against terrorism. If we in turn, in some way or another, became terrorists to others. Again, I'm walking a fine line here. I'm not here to preach and teach about politics. I'm not running for office. My primary was past week and my name wasn't found on any ballot. But there is an important truth here that fits in with our text for today. Just as it would be a shame to the memory 
and the honor of those who gave their lives to defend the freedoms that we have, just as it would be a shame for us to embrace and give up those freedoms and embrace the very ideas that they gave their lives to fight against, how much greater it is when we who have been liberated from the curse of sin and death when we who have been liberated from the consequences of sin, when we who have been liberated from the eternal death set aside for Satan and for his demons and for all those who deserve eternal death, how horrible it would be for us to disgrace and dishonor the name of Jesus Christ by in the freedom of His forgiveness, willingly not walk in line with the Spirit, not walk in line with the motivation of living a life giving Him glory, but using our freedom rather to do evil. You see, that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here when he talks about producing fruits in line with the Spirit. He talks about walking by the Spirit. He, in the earlier chapters of his letter to the Galatians, he makes it very clear that nobody is forgiven, nobody earns eternal life, nobody gets the glory of God because they deserve it, because they've done certain things. Specifically in the book of Galatians, he addresses the question or the false teaching that was out there that people who are saved are saved because they trust in Jesus and they maintain the Old Testament code of living, namely the practice of circumcision and various dietary laws. And he attacks that lie with, with, with a violence, with, a, with an enthusiasm, with a zeal of the Holy Spirit saying we are saved by grace alone. It's not because of what we do. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile, between circumcised or uncircumcised. We're all sinners and we're only saved through Jesus Christ. He clearly proclaims the battle won, the victory of Jesus Christ over sin, death, and the devil. And now having made that point crystal clear, he now speaks about how we who have been set free from that curse, we who have been set free from sin, he now turns his attention to how we are to live our lives honoring him. And if you look at this text, it's exactly the same thing as what I was talking about, how we can truly honor the veterans and those who have given their lives in service defending this country. The greatest way we can do that is not to revert back to, not willingly walk along with, will, not willingly dive into the very things they died to protect us from. And so also with Christ. As the Apostle Paul is inspired to speak about walking in line with the Spirit, he tells us to fight against in our personal struggles the Holy Spirit that is alive and well in us and the desires of the flesh. He speaks about self-control. He speaks about self-denial. Where he says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He speaks about Christian living. Not doing whatever our whims and desires tell us to do. Not to fly off the handle in anger whenever we want to. Not to spread gossip whenever it feels entertaining. Not to indulge our sexual desires in any, any way, shape, or form, regardless of what God has said. Not to simply live our lives for me, but for Christ and for the Spirit. It's not difficult to distinguish because he says the acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension and factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. In contrast, he says the fruits of the Spirit are also very obvious. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. A lot of times Christians, or at least people who are growing in their faith, or being exposed to the message of the good news, often react when they hear the gospel and how Jesus paid the price, how sins are completely forgiven, how it's just a matter which Jesus simply calls upon us simply to trust in Him. They often respond by saying, it's that easy? And the answer is, when it comes to being forgiven, when it comes to having the status of holiness and perfection, when it comes to being promised eternal life, the answer is... Yes. But what is not easy and where the struggle comes in is now that we are alive in Christ, now that we are connected to the vine, now that we are citizens of God's kingdom, now that we are God's holy and chosen people through faith in Jesus Christ, now the struggle begins because Satan wants us back. Satan wants to rip away from us. And the truth is, there's a part of us, that sinful flesh as it's referred to, that wants to give it up. And that's where Paul comes and says, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are God's children. Now walk in line with the Spirit, first of all, because it's good for you. Have you ever visited or have you ever experienced? Have you ever visited with someone who said, or have you ever experienced in your own life ever a situation where someone looks back and says, oh yeah, when I was experiencing strong jealousy or when I was giving in to selfish ambition or where I was giving in to the other obvious debaucheries of this world, I look back on it and I can see that that worked out really well for me. That was a good thing. I've never met anybody who's ever spoken like that. Even, the, even when people are trapped in it and struggling with it and up to their eyeballs in it, at least when they're speaking to me, and maybe it's just because I'm a pastor, I don't know, but whenever they've spoken to me about it, it's usually been, I don't like this, but I can't help myself. As opposed to the people... And all of us, when we see Christ's forgiveness and when He gives us the strength in some small way or in some aspect of our life to overcome a sinful habit, to overcome something that's dragging us down, something that's not in line with the Spirit, when the Lord allows us to produce fruits in keeping with His Spirit, such as joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and maybe all of it can be summed up in a form of self-control, that's when I've heard people truly give thanks to God and say, I knew I was forgiven, and I'm thankful for that. And now I'm really thankful also that the Lord is helping me deal with the temptations and situations in my life. And I've heard many a person, it's so much better now that I'm sober. It's so much better now that I'm no longer in a constant battle with fill in the blank. It's so much better now having that peace that Christ was able to give me, not only knowing our relationship is good, but helping me work out my relationship with others. You see, that's why Christ laid down His life for us, not only to forgive us, not only to give us eternal life, those are probably the greatest gifts, but even in between, in our life here, Christ laid down His life so that we would not have to suffer the full extent of our sinful flesh in this world. He gave us His Holy Spirit, not only that we may believe in Him, 
and know that we are forgiven and know that we have eternal life, but also literally we could say that we have a fighting chance to properly deal with the attacks of our own sinful flesh and the devil. And at a certain level, to even expect and to experience the joy of victories along the way. That's why Christ made the ultimate sacrifice, won the ultimate victory, so that we could enjoy peace, comfort, and all the blessings of living a life in Him. Perhaps tomorrow you will get to go to a cemetery. Perhaps you will tomorrow partake in some honor guard. Perhaps tomorrow you will take a few moments and just talk to somebody or even just sit back and remember the sacrifices that our brothers and sisters of this nation have given to preserve the peace, to preserve the Constitution, to preserve the way of life that we have. And it's a good thing to take a day to honor them. But I'm confident in saying that the greatest way and the greatest appreciation that they would have or the greatest way that they would appreciate us honoring them is to enjoy and preserve the peace and tranquility and the freedoms that we have in this nation. And not to willingly give them up or be deceived into trading them in for something that definitely is not better. If that's true when it comes to the temporary blessings that we have in this world and in this nation at this time that the Lord has given us, how much truer it is when it comes to the blessings of living a Christian life. To be able to call ourselves children of God because of what Christ has done for us. To actually know the difference between right and wrong not just in human eyes, but in God's eyes because of the wisdom that He has instilled in our hearts and placed in our minds through His Word. And what a great way it is to honor our Lord and to give Him thanks. To live a daily life recognizing the fact that our temptations, our feelings, our desires will often be in conflict with what the Spirit moves us to think, feel, and desire according to His power, with His strength, and yes, with the encouragement of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we can fight the good fight and not only look forward to eternal life, but produce fruits of faith that honor our Lord and benefit our lives here and now and glorifies our God into eternity. You are the people of God. Christ died and rose again. He has won the victory. May we all continue to be filled with the Spirit that we may serve Him in gladness now and forever. Amen. Before we continue with our worship, we're going to welcome the youngsters in for the kids' church, and they're going to come forward and sing their songs for this month.
Thank you very much. I'm glad I was sitting down because if I was standing, I'd probably start dancing. We continue giving our honor, our respect, and our love to the Lord as we gather our offerings for the day. And always remember, the Lord calls upon us to give, yes, He calls upon us to give generously, but not because we have to, but because He's given us the privilege of being part of His kingdom and to support the work of sharing His word around the world. 